Today we have famous and special speaker. I know, shall I present Professor Turski? I'm not sure because everyone knows that he initiated uh, Copernicus Science Center and scientific picnic and hundreds of thousands of people are benefiting from that. And today he will give us a talk about dimensions of life. Well, thanks a lot for, by the way, do you hear me? For, I mean, I'm supposed to talk to this machine and that's always a bit danger. Uh, okay, so thanks for the organizers of this colloquium for inviting me. Um, this is apparent, this is a, unfortunately already a second time I'm supposed to give this talk. The first one was uh, before vacations, but I was physically unable to deliver it. Uh, I'm, uh, I have to explain how come that a physicist is going to talk about something what basically is a part of a branch of contemporary science which is called mathematical biology. Uh, the reason is that I, uh, I was asked to give a course uh, of physics for a biology and medical PhD students in one of our PhD schools which we have jointly with the Nensky Institute. And uh, uh, I had a summer to prepare for that lecture and all of a sudden I realized that uh, there is a fascinating field. And uh, I, uh, I started that talk, that lecture, and unfortunately a pandemia happens. And uh, I had it uh, through the famous tool called Zoom. And, uh, but uh, the outcome of this experiment was that I am now sure that if there was a way to start the, the life again, uh, I, I would uh, clearly uh, turn and uh, go into this direction, for this is absolutely fascinating, uh, perhaps also because I didn't know much about it. <laughs> so I learned it and I'm, I'm studying it now. And uh, uh, mathematical biology is basically a science about the evolution and um, I apologize, but I have exhausted a limit of how much I can stand giving a talk, so I hope you will not be upset that I sit down. <coughs> All right. Uh, so the title of my lecture is uh, Dimensions of Life, but uh, as you will see, I'm going to talk about the theory of evolution and laws of physics. And um, uh, as you know, the fact how come that the life exists and how it come about on our planet is a subject of a long scientific dispute. And um, uh, there is a Mm. What you see on this slide is, uh, is, is a floor of a science building of the Notre Dame University in the United States. Notre Dame is a Catholic university and the inscription is nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this is a quotation from Theodosius Dobzhinsky who is a founding father of a contemporary evolution theory. And um, the, and that was a sentence which for science has stopped a continuous discussion 
uh, whether the origin of life on Earth is related to some extra natural event. And um, uh, that discussion uh, uh, about the religious uh, reasons for existence of uh, life on Earth um, is, of course, very long. It started in 13th century uh, with the famous case of Abelard and, and uh, Bishop Tempier of Paris. But uh, I, I, I decided to start this with the, the certain story about um, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians in the history of mankind, Leonard Euler. Euler was, uh, as you know, Swiss, who most of his life used to work for um, uh, emperors. He was either working for uh, Kaiser Fritz or for uh, um, Tsaritsas and uh, Tsarinas and um, in, so either in Potsdam or in St. Petersburg. And there are two famous uh, stories about the Leonard Euler, one about his life in Potsdam and the other about his life in, in St. Petersburg. And for the purpose of this lecture, I have chosen the, uh, the St. Petersburg uh, story. When uh, Euler was there, um, he had uh, attend the many of these receptions which were held in the in the in the tsar's court to keep those people in the court involved in some kind of activities other than being drunk and uh, 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 at the time of euler uh, tsaritsa had uh, hired as the court librarian uh, one of the leaders of the intellectual uh, revolution which was uh, brewing in Paris, namely Denis Diderot. And Diderot has arrived to, Par to St. Petersburg and very quickly the court had found that the lifestyle and the views presented by Diderot are not really acceptable and they start to beg uh, emperor, empresses that she will fire the Diderot and uh, she said no I am not going to fire him but if you will find the way to get rid of him that's fine with me and the history is silent about who had figured out that Leonard Euler uh, was uh, chosen and uh, on one of the parties Euler approached Diderot and then set a f and the form he, he had spoken a mathematical formula. There are many versions of this formula, but all of them are completely irrelevant. So, for example, he spoke the formula like this, and he ended with the word, so the God exists. Uh, Diderot didn't have a focused knowledge of what, what is the meaning of what the Euler said and very quickly after that he he resigned his job and he went uh, he went uh, back to Paris and that was the beginning of the this debate in the modern times so to say which was a debate between the scientists uh, of a nature scientist or mathematician and physicist and the theologians about the origin of uh, life on the and the rules which govern the life on uh, our planet and somewhere beneath that discussion the question which is hidden is this that is the life a unique phenomenon which had happened on the surface of the earth does the life exist somewhere? Since we have no other uh, visualization or any idea how the life could look like, we only know one a phenomenon which is based on the
science fiction literature. The um, quite inter. Mm. School in Wolf, he went. Thirty years. Travel over the bridge. Uh, is famous the models of a popular of a mathematics by uh by Very famous. In the weekend. exist if it publicly
big principle that the by an And when I read it's extremely thick. then Janek who later a scientist something like right. oh, the laws of physics We could life is the phenomenon we. it explains how the crystals grow and uh, uh, it is even called the theory of growth and as we shall see uh, uh, it is related or it touches the problems of the theory of evolution and uh, I, f I have chosen for today lecture that part of the, the second 
the second characteristics of the of the life that is a growth and it started with the uh, interesting work by uh, one of the pupils of Darwin Julius Huxley back in the 19th century who got interested with the animal called Africa Tangeri this is a Western Africa crab I'm said I never I have never eaten it, but I'm told this is a very tasty. And uh, it is a very strange creature. It's not so well seen on that picture, but it will be well seen on the drawing that one of the claws of that crab is enormous and is different size. And it is, biologists claim that it is used for a communication and for the ritual sexual oriented fights between the between those scraps yes it's always the same and uh, that is not the most important <laughs> yeah. and um, and Huxley get interested in whether there is any relation between the length of that claw which is um, that red bar uh, over it, to the mass of the crab, which I meant, which is also I, this other red bar is supposed to indicate the size of the crab. And he did a lot of experiments on a lot of the examples of those crabs. Uh, and it, what you see on the right is a log log plot of a size of the of the length of that claw plotted as a log of a mass of the body of the of that animal and it turns out that this length is proportional to the mass and well we may assume that the density of a crab is constant also to the volume of the crab to the power three-fourth so it's interesting that this is a power law. That is why it's a straight line on the log plot. But also from where such an exponent comes from. And um, almost simultaneously, the German natural scientist Max Kleiber uh, uh, published in a completely unacceptable today at this to me journal a short story about measuring uh, about something which will be the main topic of this uh, talk law of allometry I will explain what it is in a second and uh, that is a kind of a power law relation between the important functionality of some living some functionality of a living organism plotted as a function of a mass of that animal and it turns out that it is exactly that according to the Kleiber law that it this functionality scales as a power to the as a, with the exponent three four and uh, quite remarkable in view of today's haste of publishing as soon as results are invented uh, was that the Kleiber published book about this his work on after the second war and uh, it is called the fire of nature and uh, Huxley published his papers um, in fully in the 50s but as you see this is a beautiful plot and that is a fact that this exponent report is the same for many different functionality of animals all the functionalities which are related to the metabolic processes which are happening in the living organism uh, this is a list of publications of the topic starting with Huxley and Kleiber 
and um, the real and uh, progress in this understanding of that phenomena is due to the works of a group of scientists run by the Geoffrey West from Santa Fe Institute. And this, this, this kind of a power law behavior which I just have mentioned is called allometry law. And allometry means that a certain functionality, for example, the length of that claw, is a power law function of a mass of the animal. And there is a coefficient, which of course depends among other things on the, what are units used for measuring these things. And the B is uh, called the allometry exponent. And uh, if you, the first individual scientist who formulated it without using the words, of course, allometry, and who had applied to predicting something in uh, natural sciences was Galileus, who described the growth of the trees and also the possible maximum height of the mountains on the planet Earth. And uh, if the, we relate, for example, the uh, a surface of the animal, the surface of our body, to the mass, then uh, uh, this obviously must follow the laws of the Euclidean geometry. And, uh, and uh, the in Euclidean geometry, the uh, allometry law should give the exponent, which is uh, n divided by the power of a space we are living, uh, living in. And uh, the question is uh, why it is not in the living nature, because we already have seen the example, uh, one example of this close of the uh, uh, crab. So, uh, and the important thing is also that this law seems to be holding for m across the all possible dimensions in the, in the living world. And the scale of a different sizes in the living of living organisms on the earth is larger than anything in astrophysics. The, the size, for example, of a mycoplasm to the size of a blue well, it is 21 orders of magnitude. This is something remarkable that all of the sudden, this strange law, whatever it is, three-fourth, two-third, will hold. I mean, it, it seems to be very strange. And, and well, that existence of such a laws, a law meter law, is completely not mentioned by our distinguished colleagues of astrophysics and the understanding that the living organisms are built according to some rules or tricks or whatever, uh, it, that does not care for the, the, the anthropic principle is, is, is very general and beautiful, but, but okay. So let me give you another example of the allometry law. That is from the worlds of birds. This is a colibri, the smallest bird on the earth, about a few grams. And this is the largest uh, ostrich, more than two meters high. And uh, ornithologists have measured the relation between the weight of the bird's egg and the body of the animal um, um, mm, for about 800 species. I mean, now it is much more. There is a metadata collected by a group of scientists from University of Kiev. Uh, and they, they, they quote 30,000 different species in the statistics. And well, that is a experimental data for birds. 
but the, this factor is approximately threefold. Um, um, this is a, another interesting plant. It is a plant of the heartbeat frequency plotted as a function of the mass of the animal. And as you see, it fits beautifully the curve m to the power mass to the power minus one fourth. Well, the minus come because the heart rate is an intensive quantity, we will call it in thermodynamics. Therefore, it is a sum quantity divided by the mass. So if it was three fourth and it is divided by the total mass, then it's the reason why the exponent all of a sudden becomes negative. But what about us, humans? At the turn of the last century, uh, the two, two centuries ago, I'm sorry, Oscar Snell, the biologist, not to be confused with the Snell from optics, had studied the relation between the mass of a human brain and to the human body. And uh, uh, he found out that this is also the power law. And he found out that this exponent is 0.66 plus minus 0 0.007. And if you really want to push the limits of truth, then it is also threefold. But in fact, it is closer to another number, equal number three, four, five. And um, that is a plot of the relation of the mass of a brain plotted as a function of a body. And I repeat, this is all our logarithmic plots. And as you see, there is a, the, the, the solid line is the three-fourth line, but the human brain, as the brain of the, not, of the chimpanzees and rhesus monkeys, does not really fit too well the three-fourth. But it fits another straight line. And that will be very interesting in a moment. Now, I, I, I skip this. Um, in the third 20s, Lotka, and in the 20th century, and another naturalist, American naturalist from Harvard, Mr. Odom, had formulated what they call the fourth law of thermodynamics, and this is this. It has been pointed out by Boltzmann that the fundamental object of a contention in the life struggle, in the evolution of the organic world, is available energy. In accord with this observation is the principle that um, in the struggle for existence, the advantage must, must go to those organisms whose energy capturing devices are most efficient in directing available energy into channels favorable to the preservation of the species. And that is the begin allows us to formulate the question from where and why the exponent is threefold. And I will, this is a definition of a fundamental quantity, which is important in the mathematical biology, which is called uh, BMR, basic metabolic rate. And that is amount of the energy used by a living organism at rest to maintain its functionality. And the energy is fed by us. Whatever happens, it comes from the sun. Humans are not capable of directly consuming the energy from the sun. But we consume the energy of the sun anyway, because the trees does do it. And the trees and vegetation consumes the sun, photons, convert it into the mass, 
which is then consumed by the animals, and that, that vegetation and these animals are then eaten by the humans and the other animals, and that is how we consume the sun energy. But anyway, that energy is somehow consumed by a dedicated to the consumption of energy organ in our life, in our body, and then it must be transported all over that body. And investigation of the bodies of a living organism suggests that the relevant transport energy network in the living organism looks like on this picture. It is a blood vessel structure in our body or the structure of the channels through which all sorts of liquids are pumped up and down within the trees, flowers, weeds and so forth. And it is obvious that we can visualize that network as a simple network of uh, channels, which is the label C on my drawing. And the one characteristic feature of this network of energy transport in the bodies of living organisms is that it has a, it penetrates the whole body, so it's space feeling, and it has a one scale labeled red, which doesn't change in a process of growth. There is a smaller scale in the structure of that network, which doesn't change. How the, each element of that network works is uh, in analysis, which I will show you now, irrelevant, but in the physics it is even more trivial, namely, this is just a pipe. This is a pipe through which the liquid, the blood or whatever, in trees is being pumped. And that pieces of the network has a certain length, certain radius, and there is a pressure difference across, uh, along that channel. And uh, that is uh, described, if you want, microscopically, by two enormously complicated set of partial differential equations. There is a one set of equations which governs the flow of the liquid which carry the energy through this network, denoted as a U, and this equation is a generalized Navier-Stokes equation. Why it is generalized? It is generalized because the biological liquids like a human blood, are not a normal liquids. Uh, the water which goes out of the faucet uh, is, uh, has a constant uh, viscosity. But the, and it's called Newtonian liquid. The blood which goes through our veins and aortas is non-Newtonian liquid. Its viscosity depends on the speed with which it moves through the channels and also depends on the, on the, on the details of the interaction, how much of it is within the channel. It is a different liquid, so to say, when it goes in our main aorta and it's very different liquid when it goes through the veins in my finger. And the walls of the blood vessels are dynamics by itself. They are not rigid bodies on which some kind of a boundary condition of velocity is fulfilled. No, the veins move. And therefore, we have another set of equations denoted by a capital Xi, which are dynamical degrees of freedom of the veins. And we have to solve this together. 
uh, this is very, as even today, it's enormously difficult problem and there are lots of supercomputer work done on it with the mixed results. But there is a book by, uh, and, but there is an approximate solution for it, which is known in from the high school, or at least it was in the high school when I was in the high school, probably today it's not, which is called the Poise flow, which is very simple to, to, pr to prove that the amount of liquid which passes through this pipe is inversely proportional to the length and proportional to the fourth power of the radius and assuming the viscosity is constant. And uh, there is a book by Mr. Funk, Biodynamics, who were the kind of approximate solution for a simplified network of those equations is mm, attempted at least. But uh, I will show you uh, something about this, which is done by a method which was used by a hydrodynamicians in the time when the computers were non-existing and when the computations and the analytic solutions of hydrodynamic equations for a construction of airplanes was very difficult. And that is a scaling analysis. And the living organism contains, and that is an assumption which the biologists are agreeing nowadays, that this network of veins, this, this blood vessels in our body, is actually a fractal. And if we use the theory of fractals, which started with this fantastic story of Benoit Mandelbrot, then the network is characterized by many different length scales. And I labeled this length scales by L0, L1, L2, and so forth, and so forth. And the surface, what is the surface of the important in this process of energy transport? And surely it is not the surface of our body because this is a surface of the network. And that surface of the network is enormously complicated function of those lengths. But if we choose one of those lengths, for example, L1 as a measure, then we can write the surface of the network as L1 square times a function of dimensionless variable. The only problem is that the length L0, I'd chosen it, remains constant. This is this red color, that small, that it's not changing, the smallest size of a capillary in our body. So if we now grow, and the grow is a multiplicative phenomenon, then each of these lengths is changing by a factor lambda. And therefore, the surface of the fractal is changing according to the formula which is shown on the view graph. And uh, the theory of fractals tell us that this function of dimensionless variables scales as a parameter lambda to certain exponent epsilon, which changes from zero to one. If it is zero, then we have a normal Euclidean geometry. If it is one, then the fractal is filling the whole space. Well, then this is the formula for a change of a surface and the exponent two plus epsilon f is what the mathematicians call a fractal dimensionality of the surface. And similar analysis for a volume of that fractal network will give you the, that the volume scales as a lambda to the dimension, to the exponent d nu, which is the 
fractal dimensionality for the volume. If it's so, then uh, the for epsilon going to zero, a fractal dimensionality of surface goes to two, and if epsilon goes to one to the three, and very trivially the same is for the volume fractal to the fourth, and it is very easy algebra that the surface scales as a volume of a fractal to the power, which is a ratio of a surface fractal dimensionality to the volume fractal dimensionality. So the largest number of the exponent is three-fourth. So if the fractal is really space feeling, then the surface of a fractal scales as a volume of that fractal to the power three-fourth. And now comes the fourth law of thermodynamics of Lotka. The network has to use as much energy as possible for giving it out. So we have to maximize the energy giving out by the network. But the only way the network can give the energy into our body is via the surface. So that energy, which is BMR, is, must be proportional to the surface. And therefore, for a space feeling fractals, the BMR is proportional to the three-fourth. It is nothing with the, it is just the fact that the network must fill the full body. It cannot leave your finger not fat because it will fall off. And um, unfortunately, the formula three-fourth can be written as uh, d minus one divided by d or any other combinations. And Vest and colleagues say, okay, now d is a dimensionality and in the Euclidean geometry that will be three and for Euclidean space and volume relation, it's also the same formula. So we, we should call a fact, this number D a dimension of life. And the dimension of life turns out to be equal four. I think there is absolutely no reason to draw such a conclusion for this because the same formula is D plus one, is D divided by D plus one. And you can play all sorts of games, but anyway, Dimensions of life is nowadays equal four, which uh, Mr. West and colleagues have uh, used for whatever purpose they have chosen. But is it D equal four always? And um, I mention this brain business by Mr. Snell. And that is a paper by two Chinese physicists, He and Zhang, who, with the title Fifth Dimension of Life and the Four Divided by Five Allometric Scaling Law for Human Brain. And to discuss that, we have to go back to the 17th century. In 1611, just before Christmas, Johann Kepler uh, was traveling from Graz to Prague. Uh, he was uh, his emperor uh, astrologist, and he was supposed to be in, in for Christmas at the court of Rudolf II. And uh, he was stuck in a snowfall somewhere in the inn and he realized that he will be late to write a yearly report from Grant. Uh, there were no Grants at the time, but uh, Kepler was working for an emperor and uh, government usually didn't like to pay scientists too well. 
so uh, he had a lots of side jobs. One of them was a job with the Graf von Weckenstein, and he had to write something for a Weckenstein for Christmas, and he, writ he had written in that inn somewhere in the snow-covered Austria a, 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 a paper about the hexagonal snow, seven-cornered snowflakes. Uh, it's remarkable because uh, Kepler was uh, short-sighting. He, 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 he never did any observation by himself. He was only reading observation of Tycho de Brahe uh, in astronomical. And um, the, the, he, he, but anyway, he had, he had developed a first theory of crystallization and growth of crystals using only hard spheres. He was using a geometry of close packing of hard spheres in three-dimensional space. And through that, he invented a correct idea that the snow is, uh, is hexagonal. This is a picture of a network of uh, snowflakes growing. And uh, fractal physicists used to describe that kind of grow by taking the cluster of the snowflakes, drawing some kind of a sphere around it. How and what is that sphere is another story. It is a um, complicated mathematics, uh, the construction. I, I'm not, anyway, it's, it's approximately a sphere. And they find out that the surface of a snowflake grow as that radius of that fictitious sphere to the power delta. And numerical calculation for that delta gives 2.26 or 9 fourth. Uh, these are the brain uh, cells which and the structure of uh, brain cells look very similar to the network of uh, snowflakes. And therefore, this factor 4, 5 comes about because Mr. Zhang and uh, he and Zhang derived the expression that the BRM, BRM for brain depends on an exponent is 3 divided by 6 minus delta. And if delta is a snowflake delta, then it is a fourth fight. So the brain dimensionality is 5. Well, remarkable. But there are other laws of allometry in biology. And um, uh, this is a squirrel, and you all remember the beautiful story by Jan Brzechwa called Nat Orzech. Uh, I spent hours trying to... I, I'm not familiar with the English translation of Jan Brzechwa poems, so I try to... I apologize, but I have to admit I spent some hours trying to translate that nut into English. And I, I used the f artificial intelligence, but it didn't translate it well. So the only thing I managed basically sensible was the first line, miał pan rejen zezwolenia twardy orzech do zgryzienia. I can tell afterwards this whole world this whole poem, because I remember it. And what you see on the right is a, is a rodent jaw. And as you remember, the story is that um, nothing happens, nothing can help Mr. Notary to open up that nut, except that finally a little squirrel goes by and eats that. So the question is, that we are interested now in the force exerted by a, by a squirrel, by the rodent Joe. And turns out that there is a allometry law about it. The force of the rodent Joe is proportion to the mass of a rodent. And this is 
for many species of rodents to the power 3.7. So making a story about the dimension that there is uh, something peculiar with this exponent is not. The only peculiarity is that biology have chosen a space filling fractals to provide the energy transport through the living organism. And it provides it independently of the size of the animal and type of a species and anything. So I would like to end my lecture. Oh, well, the, there are some other allometry law. There are allometry law about the about these uh, clouds, and there are different exponents for uh, for uh, cirrus clouds and for nimbus clouds. And uh, a friend of mine, a poet, Jacek Hohenser, had found out uh, a beautiful fractal uh, uh, of the copper permitting through the rocks in the in the uh, Charnibur in Kamienna Gura in the lower Silesia. I hope it is not destroyed by the flood nowadays. So there, there, there are lots of these laws and they are not related to any mysterious dimensions of law. So I would like to end up with a quotation from a famous operetta by Gilbert and Sullivan, Her Majesty's Ship Pinafore, which says, things are seldom what they seem. Mathematical biology is in its infancy as compared to the theoretical physics. But it is remarkably interesting. And uh, perhaps one day we will be able to listen to the, a true story given by a true mathematical biologist here, not as someone who is uh, in a very humble way attempting to, to understand a, a bit of, the, of it. But it, it, it is a remarkable, I mean, remarkable what they are really looking. I mean, you have, might have heard about the story about the progress in making artificial eye. And that is also a mathematical biology. It turned out that they, 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 they get a different model of how the human eye is working. And it, it, it now looks much closer to what is feasible technically to be to be prepared and thank you for your patience okay. so we are fractals and now we should ask some questions we don't see anything uh, you mentioned a few times just mentioned uh, uh, entropic principle or anthropic principle. Mm -hmm. If you meant uh, entropic and entropy, so no, I mean anthropic. Uh, anthropic, okay. Anthropic, not anthropic. No, okay. no, no, no. No, no, okay. So, although, although uh, okay. some of the astrophysicists are, all right, all right, are okay, okay, okay. Using okay. That Almost as the same word. Okay, so no, no, anthropic, so I, so I, I will refer to entropic principle. No, 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 of, no, 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 no. I, I mean, it's, it's anthropy. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a Carter idea that the that the universe laws are adjusted such as to. Yes, uh, I know. Yes, I know. I know both principles, but could, no, could not I'm understand. I'm sorry okay. if I misspoken. Then I, okay. No, I apologize okay. for no, no, all, but all, all the my, language mistakes and my question, not mentioning other mistakes I have made. So my question is the following. Why you did not mention entropic principle of life that was quoted by Schrodinger? What is life in his book? And shortly that the life, so you mentioned a few times the concept that we, we need energy for our life and so on. But in fact, we are taking energy as humans, as also as planet, and immediately we are exporting this energy. Otherwise, we would have the problem. And so the, the, the balance is nearly zero, usually. Okay, in different uh, epoch of our life, it, it's, it's not zero. But uh, what is really important is the entropy. I mean, it, so it's a fact the free energy. 
we need energy of the of the low entropy and we are exporting the energy of the uh, high uh, entropy yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, so I, I this was the concept the of Schrodinger. I only yeah. would like to mention that I was used word and energy as Lotka had written, but even that is wrong. That should be the free energy. The energy by itself doesn't play any role in the in that. <laughs> it should, but I mean, it's. Uh, I only have one hour, and if I will be obliged to talk about the free energy and entropy, then I wouldn't be able to <laughs> get anything, uh, information. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, uh, but I, I, the, the attempt to give that lecture was to get you interested in that. I mean, to convey the fact that this is, uh, this is enormously interesting branch of science which is just stars which just it, i mean it it looks that the physics is important there i mean it it the physicists should get there because we 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 have more tools than the biologists are even, even so that was but i i fully agree i mean the entropy is there were so obviously the transport of energy is one reason why uh, the flow of blood is organized this way or, or a different way. But I think the transport, the chemical transport of oxygen, carbon dioxide or whatever I, else I is care. equal. Can you move a little bit further? Because uh, okay, it's not only the transport of energy which should be relevant here, but also the transport of uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide and other chemical of, co yeah, but components other, throughout other, the body. Other, other transport is goes also through the, there is only one, um, uh, the equations are more complicated. Because I mean the the that I could have added heat transport equation, right? I can add all those. Uh, th that just makes the things even more complicated. But uh, the beauty of a scaling laws is that it is independent. I mean, I I I I don't need to solve any any differential equation. I mean, the Theodor von Karman had built up the whole hydrodynamics without solving differential equations almost, because he, he, he wouldn't be able, I mean, you, it, there is no solution to Navier-Stokes equation. Thank you. Ukrash, uh, 50 years ago, Philip Anderson <coughs> formulated his famous more is different. You can't reduce uh, biological processes to physics. I, I don't hear you. I'm saying that Philip Anderson, yes. 50 years ago, formulated more is different in discussion between reductionism and deductionism in about science. And the point of Anderson was that, for example, you cannot deduce the law of biology from chemistry and law of chemistry from physics. You try to do it otherwise, I believe. I, 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 I can't answer that. That's too complicated for me. Uh, the, I, I believe there, the answer is in mathematics of that. I mean, that's uh, without having a better from mathematical formulation of uh, biological principles, we will not make uh, more progress. I mean, I, I was so, I was flabbergasted that it is possible to to um, to get this three four. I mean, that that seems to be the fact of nature. I mean that. I mean, there are so many data that, uh, that, 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 and, and, uh, and uh, geometry doesn't help. So, Professor Bionic. Okay. Oh. I believe that the main difference between these biological considerations and physics is that God was very helpful for physicists. 
namely in physics physics we have something like a scale that is we can isolate it a simple case solve it and then proceed further and solve more complicated cases if physics would be a, like biology then newton could not make his law sitting under the apple tree because there is an influence of the distant planets there is a lot of factors which we can isolate it and neglect whereas in biology it seems to be so interconnected that we cannot take absolutely abs right and the that's why i model. chose the growth there, there is no and not simple the model the that same. is why I choose this. I, I started <laughs> yeah. with these two things, complexity and the growth. And I was talking about the growth because I can tell something about the growth yeah. and I cannot talk is anything about the complexity. The same is true about psychology. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, it's, it, it's the, so the complicated of all of that there is no I mean, even, even this, this business with the slowest dimensionality is... Uh, 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 is uh, complicated why right? i mean it is it has a dimension and uh, from where the dimension comes from i mean it, there, there it is there right but but why why i mean it, it, it and of course there are there is lots of, and because it is not based on the good mathematics, there is so much junk in this mathematical biology. So completely ridiculous stories written. I mean, I have seen, a, for example, about this minimal length, a story relating it to the fundamental lengths in physics and I haven't seen anything about the Planck length. I haven't seen anything about the Planck length, but I'm sure it is only because I wasn't searching enough. <laughs> because if I were, if I was searching long enough or more intelligent way using my computer, I will be able to produce the results for that. So the, 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 we, we need it, but I mean, it's... it's uh, and the, 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 the difficult problem is that there are lots of people who are solving these problems on the computers and they generate a lots of out of data and other data. But uh, I mean, if you don't have analytic, even equations well written for it, then, then there is no, no way to tell, I mean, how hard it is, I mean, it is so, it's it's perhaps because life is jelly maybe that has to be a bit jelly but okay a small remark related to the question of of mikowai uh -huh. about the transport of oxygen not the transport of energy but the transport of oxygen because then we have an additional control parameter which is the uh, the, the external pressure of oxygen uh, and it can be shown so there are convincing arguments that what is limiting the size of organisms in particular vertebrates is the ability of the of the blood system to deliver oxygen um, so if we increase the amount of oxygen the organisms can grow bigger and there are scaling laws similar to this and then we can move back in the history of the earth to the times where there was higher level of oxygen. So, so over 100 million years ago, the, 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 the level of oxygen was over 30%, and the but animals that, were that, indeed bigger. That is very fine, except of the fact that there is uh, the same scaling laws are for the animals which are non depending on oxygen. We have a lot of animals, we, we don't see them because they are living <laughs> somewhere we don't. But we don't like to be <laughs> I mean, under under at the bottom of the seas in these crevices somewhere down there there are they the the problem is internal it is 
The network is not description of a mechanism via which the energy is fed into the network. What you are talking depends on the, the beginning of the network, right? I mean, I was, the, the, the three-fourth comes from, is a domination of a structure of a network over the way how the energy is fed into the network. That I, I must admit, I haven't seen work like this, but that, that's, again, I am not a biologist. I, I may, maybe there are people working on it. I just didn't, didn't find it. I mean, I, it's only three years and I'm getting busy, with, unfortunately, with other issues. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you very much for the marvelous lecture and very interesting intellectual journey, I must say, myself. Uh, just a comment maybe to say that astrophysicists also uh, considered fractality and that was in my idea that the universe yeah, should, be, they, they, should they, be very simple at large scales and that gets complicated as you go to small, small scales and then all of a sudden it gets simple again once you move to particle uh, particles. But yeah, it, it, we tested the large scale structure of the universe and the dim fractal dimensionality has been computed for the galaxy distribution and it's very low. So it seems that it's not space feeling fractal. But then again, one interesting comment on this point that I got, got while watching to your lecture is that some of the galaxies, we have also parallels in cosmology and astrophysics, we love them, nature loves them. And some of the galaxies exhibit interesting scaling relations between luminosity and um, size or velocity. But most of this relation fail to, to follow the exponent you would expect from naive dimensional uh, scaling, so it must be some hidden extra thing there that breaks the symmetry or it's not universally uh, filled with stars. So I now just give the idea that maybe there's some fractality to the to the galaxies themselves. Not fully fractals, but maybe a little bit. So make the scaling move away from the dimensional scaling. But isn't so that this is so difficult with the, fr with the fractal geometry in astrophysics that the universe is not self-similar? Uh, and uh, and uh, if something is not self-similar, then the fractal seems to be... There are some comments in the Mandelbrot. I mean, we, we cannot ask, unfortunately, Mandelbrot anymore. He might, he, maybe he knew someone. You, can, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, referring to this dispute by those two distinguished scholars, that uh, there is a problem that humans have difficulty to apprehend that there could be some organized, uh, call it organism, with, that I be, be, they, 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 uh, that uh, their existence is based on the completely different principles that our human biology. I want to mention that that's uh, one of many cornerstones of Stanisław Lem writing, uh, like Invincible, there is a beautiful story, and then his last story, Fiasco. And they are both referred directly to the fact that there could be, in principle, a self-organized, quote-unquote, organism in the universe, which, are, which cannot be understood by humans, because they are not based on the similar principles as we are. <laughs> Can I can I say something is still uh, the that thank you I, mean, I, I just 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 something pick up in my, uh, is anyone except a few of individuals in this room I know who were friends of Bogdan Mielnik. The Bogdan Mielnik uh, was a physicist and uh, unfortunately he's no longer with us and he was he he also was writing a science fiction story mm -hmm. and there is one of his science fiction stories about the uh, sure enough it's somewhere the, as always somewhere far away and blah 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 blah, blah, blah and there are some some uh, uh, giants living in some cave somewhere in on the planet and all of a sudden they make a discovery that they, they have a brain. And they, they, one of them is doing some experiments on the brain of this and this other life, right? And get 
an insight to that brain and find out that there is a trace of from where that, let's call it brain of those strange, this govern, this central unit grows. And all of them, the sudden find out that this central unit out of which it grows, that their manners is, has a five fingers. And the story is that these are the remnants of the humans who left the earth and, <laughs> and so forth. And that, of course, explains why the, those Chinese have agreed to the five-dimensionality five -dimensionality of, 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 of the human, human brain that this will prevail in the cosmos and so, and so forth. So the last question of Victor. Uh, in the, in this, my remark, I want a little bit cool the um, fantasies that has been erased after this talk. I just about, about uh, the power law it's themselves. So that I once I was cal um, calculating the length of uh, self um, uh, uh, of um, uh, polymers from the um, okay, the length of polymer, and what I found that I have exact solution, but it's very, very uh, lengthy, and it's not you, you don't see anything. And then I applied for uh, approximate method just to simplify this formula, and I found. Lots of power law. This paper, paper is is uh, published in uh, in the Journal of Statistical Physics. What I my conclusion was that the universality of this power law is just because it's very well approximate the result that otherwise are very complicated. So I, what I want to say that mathematics uh. is also our choice of. Uh, presenting thing, it can be written in a different I, way. You're right. I, the power laws are extremely. I, I had this slide, I didn't want to get involved in the discussion about the, the allometry law is used in the propaganda. The, uh, the, the, the picture I had, and, and there are many others, there are uh, the economists use the tricks. Because if you had the, or the, the, the painting is, you have a decline value of a dollar from a time of President Eisenhower to the time of a Carter. And the dollar Eisenhower was a 44 cents for Carter. Now, how do you plot it? Linearly or in the size of the bank? And if you want to be against President Carter, you plot it, you plot it as a surface. And if you want to plot it for Mr. Carter, you plot it linearly as a size. And that, the, 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 this, is, this is used permanently. There is even a whole book about the uh, uh, extremely expensive books I haven't bought it. Professor Kafka. Da. A graphical presentation of numerical. Da, da. It is possible to, to, to cheat a lot about this graphing. Mm -hmm. And all this, if you, if you, if you change the, whether you, you use in the, uh, how do you call it, the circular plots, right? Not, mm, there are people drawing uh, the percentage of something. Mm -hmm. Where were they? Pie chart. Mm -hmm. Pie charts. Pie chart. Ah. Chakos. Chakos. Yeah, sure, no, pie chart. <laughs> the pie charts and the and the <coughs> and depending whether you use the angle or the radius. That's very different. I mean completely different. Okay. Thank you for listening. Yeah. I apologize so, for all the mistakes. So let's thank again.